everyone. Um, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to see so many of you here today at noon for our first Second Tuesday Forum in 2017. And um, I think it's as much of the personality and the uh, following of our guest, but that's okay, I'll take it. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope everybody had a chance to get a program so you'll know what else is coming. We will be keeping all of the rest of the Second Tuesday Forum this season at Church Um We had a lot of people who said it was just so difficult downtown between the stairs and the parking and the accessibility, so we're trying it here in this wonderful room that we are very, very proud of that we built with the uh, for the Churchland Branch Library. Uh, many of you already know Captain Watkins, but I am gonna go ahead and give you a brief bio that he gave me. Um, he retired after 42 years of service with the Virginia Pilot Association. He acquired an unlimited first class pilot's license and an unlimited master's license. And this is not a pilot like you fly, this is a pilot like on a big, huge yacht, boat, vessel, ship, yeah. <laughs> For those of you that were brought up in the, any of the services, you know there's a difference between all of them. He was a member of the Virginia Board for Branch Pilots for over 20 years. He served as a special pilot for the Naval Aircraft Carriers for 15 years and also the battleship USS Wisconsin. He is past Commodore of the Portsmouth Boat Club and a past president of the Propeller Club, the Port of Norfolk, past president of the Portsmouth Museum Foundation, which is when I first had the opportunity to meet him, and a member of the Portsmouth Port and Industrial Commission and a board member of the Virginia Maritime Association. He's a lifelong resident of Portsmouth, and he and his wife like to travel and cruise on Windstar vessels and visit his grandchildren in Downers Grove, Illinois. If you will all please welcome Captain George <coughs> uh, Gracious, gracious, gracious. Thank you, Sue, for such a kind introduction, and I appreciate you reading it as I wrote it for you. <laughs> and good afternoon, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Churchton Library for our Tuesday group on October 10. I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to thank those that know me especially for coming, even though that I was going to speak. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I noticed some questionable looks when she gave the topic of my presentation, maritime pilotage in Virginia. So let's get a few questions out of the way so that you will understand what a maritime pilot is and the service that he performs. There are many uses of the term pilot even within the maritime industry. The type addressed in my talk will be the traditional and most common use of the term. And it's an individual who comes, who is not a member of the crew of the ship, but comes on board to assist him in navigating the vessels in and out of port. Our pilots board the vessels at the boundaries of the international and in the waterways. You will see later how the pilot makes the transfer from the boarding launch to boarding ships. Yes, we do use helicopters at times to board some naval vessels. The pilot transfer really can be the very most dangerous part of a pilot's job, especially in severe weather conditions. Our pilots often serve on vessels that they have never or rarely encountered before, and we must work closely with foreign crews, some of which have limited English skills. As usual, just before I left home, I always tell my wife, Mary Jo, where I'm going, who I'm addressing, and what I plan to talk about. She's here today, but she didn't break stride. She says, well, just remember, you're going to be talking to some very intelligent people, so you speak about 10 minutes and sit down. <laughs> now, mariners speak a universal language, and most of our terminology comes from our experiences aboard ships. 
no matter to what port you sail, Pilate's language is universally and accepted and the same. Beyond the language comes the pilot's inner view of his world and his responsibilities. In fact, as you watch the pilots ply their trade in the ports of Virginia, most of what we do for a living cannot be put down into words. Each pilot has his own unique way of doing what is somewhat common to pilots around the world. Even in the presence of modern day electronics, when a pilot shakes hands with a ship's captain and that captain turns over the conning of his ship to the pilot, it's a repetition of a time-honored custom in history filled with tradition. The earliest charter for organized pilots was given to the Trinity House pilots in 1369 in England, and it gave them the general powers for safety and progress on the Thames River. In 1604, King James I granted compulsory pilotage to its members, and this was a pattern for the royal government in Virginia to foster its system of pilotage. One of the greatest strengths of the guild or apprenticeship system was, of course, its time-honored policy of policing its own. Obviously, no such knowledgeable maritime experts were available in 1607 when Captain Christopher Newport after crossing the Atlantic bound for Jamestown, showed up off the Virginia coast with his three little ships, the Susan Constant, Godspeed, and Discovery. And after planting a cross on the beach at Cape Henry, which some recognize as the first Thanksgiving day, it took Captain Newport three additional weeks feeling his way up the James River before he reached his destination of Jamestown. However, on subsequent voyages of supply, to the Jamestown colony, local mariners became available to undertake piloting them to safety, and it's been so ever since. By the year 1609, Virginia colonists at Jamestown had expanded to three additional plantations. One group of about 150 people began a plantation at the falls of the James River, the present day site of our state capital, Richmond. Another offshoot of nearly the same size moved to the Nansenman River in today's Suffolk. The name Nansenman means fishing point and the Nansenman tribe was one of the largest tribes in Virginia. A fourth group of about 60 souls resided on Old Point Comfort and they fared much better than the other groups due to a better food management program and an ample amount of seafood which made for a more quiet relationship with the Indians. One of the people living on Old Point Comfort was a pilot, John Clark. And in June of 1611, Clark was summoned and boarded a Spanish vessel anchored near Old Point Comfort to direct her to sea. On his arrival at Cape Henry and his yaw boat in sight, the master refused to slack his sails and did not allow pilot Clark to disembark. He was made a prisoner and carried back to Spain where he spent several years in a dungeon before the British government could arrange for his release. Interestingly enough, he found his next assignment as second mate on board the famous Mayflower. But Clark had managed to have another rendezvous with history when his vessel that was bound to Jamestown was driven off course by bad, was driven off course due to bad weather and landed at Plymouth Rock, and hence was the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But the main thing to remember here, ladies and gentlemen, is that there was a Virginia pilot on board the Mayflower. <laughs> in the ensuing years, as Virginia colonies grew and prospered, and more ports were developed, the tobacco trade took on an increasing importance, and shipping assumed an even greater role in the colonial economy. This meant that the government assumed an increasing role in regulating the conduct of pilots by setting the fees that they might collect for their services and otherwise supervising Virginia trade. To begin with, almost anyone who desired could represent himself as a pilot. But by 1661, with general dissatisfaction with the pilots, it prompted the Virginia House of Burgesses to pass its first Navigation Act. 
And this created among the independent pilots the office of chief pilot, of which Captain William Owen was the first appointee. He was followed by a Captain Chichester, who in turn was followed by his son, William Chichester. They were also charged with training apprentice pilots. And so began the endorsement of the tradition where sons followed their fathers in the creation of a pilot dynasty. As early as 1662, the British merchantmen were petitioning King Charles to regulate the arrival and departure times for ships bound for Virginia. But because of national competition between the shipping lines, their requests were denied. As late as 1674, the Spanish had warships in Chesapeake Bay. And, in, and during that year, one was able to overtake a vessel called the Thomas and Murray of Norfolk. They plundered her cargo at that time that was valued at about 6,000 pounds sterling. Now in today's, <coughs> today's dollars, the cargo would be valued at about $1.6 million. By 1703, the Virginia planters were beginning to realize the value that awaited them once their gold leaf tobacco crops reached the markets in Europe. That brought about the request for convoy protection for vessels carrying this precious cargo. Over the next hundred or so years, the pilots were very fragmented and they just could not get organized for the betterment of the craft. There were pilot groups for each area and the rivers that they serviced. With so many plantations growing Tobacco, it was felt that each area should have its own pilot group and provide their own pilot boat. For example, in 1691, Butte Street in Norfolk was considered a pilot town, as was Queen Street in Hampton. The pilots, being somewhat business oriented, began purchasing acreage on the rivers that they serviced and were growing the gold leaf tobacco for export on the ships that they piloted. The routes for the various trading towns were learned and recorded by the early Virginia pilots, but charts for these rivers were very shallow on information. The pilots had to continually practice the ancient art of depth finding with the use of the lead line. This was very guarded information and kept in the log books of the pilots as well as all the title information. Some of the more guarded figures were even memorized and passed on to the apprentices as was the custom followed in England. In really shoal waters, many pilots even practiced depth recording with a sounding rod, which is still used today by some of the Maryland oystermen. By 1762, the royal government became more involved in regulating the independent pilots. At that time, they made a rule that the pilots had to be appointed by a court in the county in which they resided and have a sufficient boat rigged with an 18-foot keel. Now the biggest problem with this law at the time was that if an inbound vessel was sighted, the first pilot boat that got to the ship got the job. <coughs> this was not stable, I can tell you. However, when the pilot boarded the inbound ship, he immediately presented the master a fresh cut, fresh cut branch from a tree on the shore. And that way, the master knew that he was hiring a pilot and not a pirate. If I were to mention the name Edward Teach to you, Duff would know who it is, you might not recognize him, but if I said Blackbeard, you would know a pirate that sailed along the Virginia and Carolina coast, looting and pillaging many vessels. That's why we are still called branch pilots today. Pilotage actually goes back to biblical times and was written about in the 27th chapter of Ezekiel, who lived some sixth century before Christ. Pilots were also mentioned in the writings of Marco Polo with references to the Arab pilots. So, ladies and gentlemen, we might very well be the second oldest profession known to man. <laughs> One of the first acts of the Virginia General Assembly after it convened in Richmond in May of 1783 was to recognize the pilotage system and require each pilot to take and train one apprentice due to the loss of so many pilots due to the, due, during the American Revolutionary War. There were just not enough pilots available to handle the flood 
of merchant vessels coming to Virginia. Okay, I know you're tired of looking at that one. So notice the number of pilot boats in the vicinity of Cape Henry and the lookout atop the mast of the pilot vessel Murray. This is circa about 1794. As previously mentioned, an inbound vessel, when it is, once an inbound vessel was sighted, the race was on, and the pilot with the fastest boat normally got the job. And once the pilot presented the master a fresh cut branch from the shore and identified himself as a pilot, the race, the voyage began. Today's Virginia Pilot Association, my association, was established by legislation of Virginia's General Assembly in 1866 through the efforts of Captain Samuel Wood of Hampton, Virginia. Our first board for branch pilots was established in 1866, and here we are some 151 years and some 160 pilots later with just a few differences. One must ask themselves, what lures young men and women, yes, we do have a woman pilot, into the profession of piloting? Some of them have sailing experience and some have small sailing experiences and small pleasure craft and some have attended maritime academies. I can honestly say that many of them think they know what they're getting into, but they really don't know all that this profession requires. I always found the piloting part of the job the easiest. The Virginia pilots are certainly well trained in every respect to perform their duty. We know that the five-year apprenticeship <coughs> is what makes good pilots, and we do not even shorten that time, even for maritime ap applicants from the Maritime Academy. Does it take five years to make a competent pilot? I think that it does, and you will see later in the talk, uh, I must point out that about 40% of the apprentices that start drop out of the program. Is it their love of the water? A job that carries a lot of responsibility, the challenge of a job that not everybody can do well. I wish that I could tell you their reasons. I can tell you my reasons for becoming a pilot. I was a good small boat sailor and saw many large vessels navigating the Elizabeth River and knew that I wanted to be on one of those vessels in any capacity. I'd read many of Mark Twain's books and the thought of becoming a river pilot was never out of my mind. When I started my apprenticeship, we spent most of our time on the large pilot boat around the face of Cape Henry. For the first six months, I learned how to get hot coffee for the senior pilots. I polished the brass in the wheelhouse. I stood to watch and had to learn the Morse code because at that time there were no radios. And we assisted in the boarding. Whoops. Here we go. There we go. And we assisted in the boarding of every ship in the, in the yawl boat. And we rode ships back and forth with the senior pilots for experience. And we studied on board the pilot boat in our spare time along with boarding ships in these yaw boats. Yes, we would land men on the, pot, on the beach in fresh northerly breezes, and you better not get one of them wet, or if you did, you might stay on the boat for an additional month or so. The main thing, this was a harsh reminder that this business of pilotage was a 24-7 operation, and it just did not stop. It was a job in which we soon learned that safety on the job wasn't everything, it was the only thing. Now, here we are. The vessel pictured here is a replica of the pilot, Sail Pilot School of Virginia, and she was the fifth ocean keeping vessel owned by the Virginia pilots. She was the last of the Sail Pilot Schooners, as I said. Her dimensions were 122 feet in length and her beam was 24 feet. She went into service, Virginia Pilots, in 1916 and retired from that service in 1939. But you know, she was eventually put back into service as a vessel of the Gloucester Fishing Fleet and she went on to win many fishing schooner races between Halifax, Nova Scotia and Marblehead, Massachusetts. Now, the Pilot Boat Virginia, this was the one that I first thought of my apprenticeship on was a yacht built by the New Purdue Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in 1925 for Mr. Hiram P. Bingham. And the Virginia pilots bought her in 1932, and she served until 1971. 
The second Virginia is the ex-Coast Guard Cutter Comanche. She was built in 1934 and served the Virginia pilots from 1968 to 1981. I must say that these two vessels held station and only came in six times due to bad weather at the Capes in 50 years. The picture of the pilot boat in the ice uh, was taken in the winter of 1978 in Lindhaven Inlet. And you'll notice the little launch coming, the, our boarding launch coming along, and she's following in the wake of the mothership because at that time that boat had a fiberglass hull and she was protecting the fiberglass from the ice. And then you notice the ladder here on the port side of the Virginia. That's how pilots got on and off from the launch onto the pilot boat. It got down and then went over to ships to the inbound ships. Uh, that was the way that the, transfer, that the pilots transferred in all weather from the launch to the pilot boat. Uh, I just could not, well, I better put this in, because I can tell you that was one of the most dangerous parts of a pilot's job, move, making that maneuver. And I just couldn't leave you with that icy picture. And here we have the same vessel on a summer cruise that we took. We'd invite all of the members of the maritime community to come down, and we'd go down and take a look at the United States and whatever. It was a very, very popular thing. In fact, probably one or two of you may have even been on one of those cruises. I began piloting vessels in 1958 after serving just 15 months into my apprenticeship, which normally took 24 months. And this was due to a shortage of pilots. Very few ships sailing those days had radar equipment. Navigation was done by dead reckoning. Using a good watch and knowing the distance between the buoys, standing on the wing and listening for the bells and whistles, that was real grassroots piloting. So here we have an overview of the apprenticeship training program now for our apprentices. And it's somewhat similar to the program that I went through, but I can tell you it was nowhere near as demanding. Uh, all of the Virginia pilots are required to have three licenses, a state license, a federal first class pilot license, and an an unlimited uh, inland master's license as issued by the United Coast Guard. These, vessels, these licenses are renewed every five years. Our state branch license, I must say, is the one that we operate on 95% of the time. And I'm happy to say that the Virginia Pilot Association is the only association on the eastern Gulf Coast that requires all of its pilots to have a master's license. So let's get to the more interesting part of this talk. Today I want you to remember two words, command and control. It's a simple explanation of what the pilot's role is when he boards a vessel to direct her in and out of port. The master is always in command of his vessel. The pilot is there as an advisor to the master. And should a question arise or the pilot does a maneuver that the master does not like, he can simply tell the pilot to stand down and he will now direct the navigation of the vessel or he can call for another pilot. When a pilot boards a vessel, maritime law requires that there be a master pilot exchange of information which brings each of them up to speed on any conditions that might affect the safe passage of the vessel. Once this exchange has taken place, the master turns over the control of navigation to the pilot. It's a tradition that has taken place for centuries. In performing some 12,000 pilots, I never had a master question my actions in handling his vessel in getting her in and out of port. Now we finally moved ashore in 1981, and this is a chart of the entrance to Chesapeake Bay where we begin and, and end our piloted service, right in that area there. This and all of the charts that we use as pilots have to be drawn from memory on all original examinations. And believe you me, after you've drawn these charts as many times as I did, you have a mental picture that you never forget. You know where the deep water is, and you know where the deep water isn't. And then here, this is our present facility at the entrance to Lynn Haven Inlet. Here on one, one, one uh, area there, we have our, our, our offices, sleeping quarters, waiting areas for ships, repair facility, boat lift, all on the same site. That makes it a real nice operation. One of your boats breaks down, it's always good to get her to the dock, get her up, 
see what's wrong with it and put it back. Now, our control tower is at the base of the new Cape Henry Lighthouse. And this tower is basically like a control tower at the airport. We can talk to vessels around 75 miles away and begin to plot them on our radars about 30 miles away. So here the pilot, whoops, here we go, that's another one of the tower. So here the pilot has been called. He's coming down from the lounge area there. We'll step from one solid surface to another solid surface. I can tell you that's made the uh, process of boarding and, and discharging and getting on and off 50% safer. So here we are off Cape Henry on a nice summer day. You can tell it's summertime because the, all the doors are shut and the riders don't want to waste that air conditioning. So here we have the same launch on a little breezier day. And this is, the wind is out of the northeast and the swell is beginning to build. And you can see here that there's a pilot boat going out and I'll show you some more. But those swells are about eight to 10 feet high. And you've got to remember that the swells are just as big at nighttime as they are during the day. So you can see the swell building and you can see the pilot boat going up and there he's gone over. So let's back that up one more time. I kind of like these shots. Going out, going up, and going over. And he's gone out to uh, take a pilot off of an outbound ship, which you will see in this area. Now this ship will go out, and he's heading about northeast. He'll go out and swing around and put all the swell on the starboard side and I don't know whether you can pick it up, but there's a pilot ladder hanging just about right in there. But he will not, the pilot launch will not come alongside until after he has gone out. Now that ship's about 600 feet long, so you can see that's a pretty good sized wave. And then after this, of course, is a nice salt water bath. So let's back that up just a little bit. He'll go out, come out, turn to the starboard, put, put the rough side, make this starboard side the lee side, the wave breaks, then a nice wave, then they get around. So the next shot that we have, the pilot's been taken off, and the launch is laying off Linhaven, waiting for a good wave to come in so they can shoot the inlet. Now, not every day is rough, but we do have other weather conditions to deal with, and that is the fog. Here the launch is approaching a vessel from about 200 feet away, from about 100 feet away, and from about 50 feet away. We always go around the stern of an inbound ship for safety reasons because it's awful hard to get hit if you're coming up a stern of another vessel. Once on board the vessel, the pilot and the master will have their conference and decide on whether or not the vessel would proceed into port or wait for the weather to improve. 99% of the time, the vessel proceeds into port with the use of the vessel's radar and the pilot's digital GPS global positioning system. Ships are on a schedule, and they want to keep that schedule if at all possible. A container ship today costs between $65,000 and $125,000 per day to operate. They do not make money sitting still. Pilotage in foggy weather and the really bad weather is where the pilot shows his expertise and the real value of his service. What is he really expected of the pilot is to get the vessel safely to the berth, if at all possible. So here we have two vessels meeting in Thimble Shoal Channel. Here is an outbound coal ship, maximum draft, 50 feet, that had to sail the coal pier to get high water at Cape Henry. And then this one is an inbound container vessel. The horizontal distance between these two ships is about 300 feet. Now, international maritime law limits a pilot's climb to 10 meters or 33 feet. I can tell you from the bottom of this ladder to that platform is 33 feet. So if you have a fear of heights, pilotage is probably not your game. And here we have some of the shots of the pilot getting off the pilot launch, going up the ladder, boarding in, and then the next one is the pilot is coming down the ladder, disembarking. The, the ship never stops, it keeps going a few knots through the water, and that lets the pilot launch lay alongside. Now, 
This is a picture of a burst line. We call these the Cadillacs of pilot ladders because you step on and they lower you down or you step on and they lift you up. That's, that's a real, real great thing for us full-figured boys. <laughs> so here we have, let's see. Yes, and we do pilot naval vessels. They are, they're public vessels and they're not required to take pilots, but they do so at the discretion of the captain of the ship. We do pilot all the aircraft carriers and most of the submarines. So here we have the USS Eisenhower approaching the Naval Operating Base after coming in from sea. And then the next morning I snapped this picture. She's going up the southern branch to the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. I, I like that picture. You can see how narrow it looks up there because you can't see the land on one side there. Uh, we always board the inbound aircraft carriers by helicopters in the vicinity of Chesapeake Light, which is about 15 miles to seaward. I know we have some Navy vets in here, so I'm going to put a little uh, human interest story here. Uh, captain Bob, about Captain Bob Sprigg, who was the captain of the USS George Washington, I was ordered to fly to the Washington and had to be at the Naval Air Station around 12 noon. And we took off on time, and after the ride that normally took 25 minutes, I looked at my watch and we'd been gone 40 minutes. So I asked the pilot what was taking so long, and he replied to me, that uh, it was foggy and he could not locate the carrier. So, and if we did not locate it, in the next 10 minutes we were going to turn around and return to the air station. I did not want that to happen. The next thing I knew, there was a loud bump and we were on the deck of the Washington. <laughs> once, the, uh, once on the bridge, I met Captain Sprigg and we shook hands and he looked at me and said, George says, what do you think about going to Norfolk? I said, well, let me look at the radar, which I did, and I couldn't see any close traffic around. So I said, well, I think that's a good idea, but we got to turn this big rascal around. She's heading southeast, and we got to go northwest. <laughs> so we put the wheel 25 degrees to the starboard, and, uh, to the right, and made a, uh, to the starboard, and made a nice slow turn, came around, and when we got lined up, we picked up the junction buoy, which was about eight miles away. Uh, I knew that the closer that we got to Cape Henry, the weather was going to clear. When the junction buoy was about two miles away, you couldn't see it. When it was about three quarters of a mile away, you couldn't see it. When it was about a half a mile away, it came into sight clear. So we went up and we rounded the buoy and entered the South Atlantic Seaway. About 20 minutes after we got in the seaway, it was bluebird clear, thank goodness. So we increased the speed to 15 knots and went on up to the Naval Operating Base. It was a routine trip, uh, ending with the Washington being docked at Pier 12 along. There were several people on Portsmouth on, on board, which I didn't know at that time. But anyway, it was a special day for Captain Sprigg because it was his last sea duty. And it was very important for that ship to be alongside the dock with no problems. So here we go. Yes, our pilots do pilot submarines. Well, I was, we, we fly with helicopters, but our pilots do uh, pilot submarines. We call most of them black tubes of death. Uh, if the temperature is 80 degrees or the light uh, or above, uh, a light jacket is sufficient. But if not, they give you a heavy coat for your own comfort. Uh, these next slides are part of a continual education program that all of our pilots go through. This was in Wasash in Southampton. And it shows the two vessels meeting and two vessels overtaking. And it gave us an idea of the special effects that one vessel has on another. It was very, very important. And then the next one is over in Grenoble, France. This was uh, the docking and undocking. And if you can imagine, the ship was about 50 feet long and about 15 feet wide. And it had a rudder about the size of my hand. And it had a propeller about big as an orange. So it was very realistic in handling these things. Uh, let's see, the instructors over there were great. They were ex-North Sea ferry boat pilots and they were excellent teachers. It's very interesting because the, the, the main lesson that they tried to teach us was patience. And I can tell you that's very difficult to teach a pilot patience because most of us don't have any of it. So the next one is the, still in Grenoble, we're going through the what they call the Suez Canal operation. You can see the buoy there and one over here. Well, 
they, they, they put you in the boat and you go around and you go take the Suez Canal and go around and they let you come through the second time but what they don't tell you the second time is that there no, there's another vessel coming there meeting you in that channel and it was you know it was very it was a matter of pride that you didn't bump into each other or rush each other up but it was this this real-time simulation is just a great for teaching pilots a lot of things and here we have a Carnival Cruise Line ship bound up to Nauticus on a regular call. They go in for discharging and loading passengers, but we also have quite a few other cruise ships calling in Norfolk on what we call courtesy calls. And these vessels come in for the day, the passengers are taken off, and some will go to Jamestown, Williamsburg, Virginia Beach. But I can tell you the most popular stop in Norfolk is MacArthur Mall. They love it. Now here is a roll-on, roll-off container ship the Atlantic Companion. And on a recent voyage, one of these vessels carried 75 of the largest Winnebago mobile homes to Europe. The cost of the service was $45,000 per vehicle, or about $3.4 million. And until Portsmouth Reed Terminal was shut down four years ago, there was an ACL vessel docked there every Friday morning for the past 25 years. Now is that keeping a schedule or what? Now this next slide shows the growth of vessels from 1970 to 2005. It's difficult to, to bring this thing up to date because ships keep getting bigger, keep getting bigger, keep getting bigger. And uh, just the other day I saw where they had uh, loaded one with 14,400 TU containers, 14,400 containers. And that what has happened, these ships have grown from 875 feet in length to a 1,312 feet in length. And they've grown from 105 feet wide to 195 feet wide. And their draft has increased almost to 50 feet. Most of these vessels can now transit the enlarged Panama Canal and all can transit the Suez Canal, which was recently widened to accommodate two-way traffic and has no draft limitations. It's about 750 miles longer going around through the Suez Canal, but there are no delays. Our channels are dredged to 50 feet and our cranes are handling ships with 26 containers across. We are ready for the next generation of ships in our port and it's very important to be the first port in and the last port out. That's why 50-foot draft limit and hopefully soon to be 55 feet is, limit is so important because one inch of draft on these vessels can equal almost a thousand tons of cargo. Unfortunately, the only thing that people see is the number of trucks hauling containers that always seem to be blocking their lane. To see how important international trade is this evening, when you retire, lay all of your clothes made in the United States in one pile and all those made outside the United States in another pile. It'll, I think it'll surprise you. So let's be sure that we all know TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units. Uh, that, that's the accepted way of measuring ships by the number of containers that they're carrying. An 8,000 TEU 20-foot container will carry 8,000 20-foot containers or 4,000 40-foot containers. And so I always end my, I think this is the next shot, yeah, I always end my, with a Port 101 lesson on what in the world is carrying all those containers. So here we go, we know that it'll carry that many cases of beer we know that it'll carry that many packs of cigarettes, and we know that it'll carry 10,000 pairs of shoes. Now, I know you ladies never spend more than $30 a pair on your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, the, the, the real stronghold is it'll carry 315 20-inch 20 uh, TVs. There we go. Uh, 2010, and can handle as you, as you go down 164, you'll notice that some of the trains are single stacked, double stacked. Well, everything that comes into Portion Virginia National Gateway now is double stacked. And that, that makes a really big difference 
because in going from Portsmouth to Chicago, it shortened the mileage by 245 miles and saving around 24 hours in transit time. Yes, we do have CXS Railroad, as they recently have completed their uh, national gateway route, giving us two major railroads with double stack capacities. Here we have the MERS terminal, was finished, was built by MERS, now owned by the Dutch and leased by Virginia National Terminals, and is known as the Virginia National Gateway. It's one of the most modern <clears throat> container terminals in the United States. And once a container has been driven on the uh, terminal, it's not touched again by human hands until it's locked on the ship and the fasting device is in place. With the larger vessels becoming a regular caller at our port, that's the beginning of the Virginia National Gateway, the larger vessels becoming a regular at our port, you could see the, um, the necessity for building this fourth container berth, container berth on the east side of Craney Island. Uh, we, we really need that. We need that bad. And here is a more detailed private. That's an area of about 500 acres. And when it's complete, it will have berthing space for nine vessels up to 1,200 feet in length. And last but not least, here's a picture of a nice sunset going down over Old Point Comfort. Pilots love to see that, especially on the way home, and I think that's a nice time to end this talk. Thank you. Do I have any questions? Please, anybody have any questions for Yes, yes, Wanda. Oh yes, it, it is a concern of ours, I can tell you. Uh, the, the main thing now is that we are trying to, to put more and more containers on railroad cars to get them away from here. Because if, if a container sits on the dock, they pay demurrage. If they get off the dock and they go to the, to the uh, place where they're supposed to be, they don't pay any demurrage. So now we are always interested in getting those containers off the port. If, if there's container, if there's cargo in them, yeah, we want to get them off here. Yes, ma'am. What about the, um, I'm assuming there's more of a demand for pilots now. Do you have, are there any numbers on people training? There are, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The, 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 the problem is, is that the ships are getting so much bigger, you need less of them. So right now, the Virginia pilots have 45. And that's, that seems to be enough right now. Absolutely not, ma'am. You're just as careful with one as you are the other. But I mean, as far as uh, how do you how do you learn to do a is it the same basic stuff? I mean, I know nothing about. Well, the the the, the apprenticeship that you go through uh, for the first two years, you're studying. You're you're riding ships with senior pilots, and when you get your first license, you go on very small ships. And then after you've been there for another six months, you go up to another size, and you go to another size. At the end of five years you're up to an unlimited size. You know, it's, it, it's not something that you just jump on and go right to the top. Are yes, ma'am? Are there still uh, people down at the top of the sun? Is that still? It has been, but it's not now. It's, you know, I mean, we, we, we really and truly, the, the requirements now for all the apprentices to be college graduates, we get some wonderful young men there. And as I say, it's not for everybody. You know, 40% of them start, don't finish. Okay, Jan, Jan Young, she started 11 years ago, and she is a free pilot now and is doing a wonderful job. She has a very good reputation. There, there, there are 1,075 state pilots, my, my job, in the United States. There's 35 women. And it's not that, that we don't accept them, we just don't have that many applicants. Yes, ma'am. About the new Mm-hmm. Part of it has been funded, 
but they expect, in fact, I was just at a meeting this morning, and they expected everything to be completed by the year 2032. So that's a long way away. Well, you know, we, 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 we are blessed in so many ways, but we're, we're hampered in other ways. In other words, one of these big ships come in, one of these supers that you've all been reading about, they put between 3,000 and 3,500 containers on the dock. Now, what do you do with those? You know, you've got to get them away from here. And, and it's just, it, there's, there's, there's always a problem that they're trying to work out. You know, how, how can we get them away from here? So, yes, Mr. Griffin. Um, with having a 40% loss, what work is being done to try to analyze what's causing that so that maybe you can have a better ratio? Are you talking about a backup? The, the loss of, of, of people who have accepted and then 40% failed. Well, it's just, not what they, it's just not what they thought of. You know, I mean, it's 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 not easy for a young man to spend four years in college and then come in and go right into two years of purgatory. <laughs> you know, we we we, you've got to treat. I mean, you got to treat them like apprentices. That's the main thing. You know, and it's a uh, it's it's a loss because I can tell you, from the time a a, a, a young man starts with the pilots. And at the time he finishes, it cost the Pilot Association about $50,000 to educate him. By the time you send him to school in France, you send him to school in England, and down in Louisiana, it's, it's an expensive process. And, you know, they get there and they, they, they just not. And it's not, you know, I, all, all I can say about that is, is that I don't look down on them. Because one of the best apprentices that I thought we ever had was now a retired judge in the city of Portsmouth. He came and stayed two months and left. And I think he made the right decision. He just wasn't happy, you know? Yes, ma'am. I think you should tell the funny little story to end about the captain and the tea and the black leather pants. Oh, okay. <laughs> just before I retired, I went on a British ship called the City of Liverpool over at Portsmouth Marine Terminal about midnight. And I got there about 11.30 and the crane was up, everything was quiet. So I walked on board the ship and went up into the wheelhouse and nobody was there. So I said, well, okay. So I went over to the kettle and I filled it full of water and put some hot water in it, you know. And it got boiling and a few minutes later, I poured myself a cup of coffee and this, by the time I was taking a sip, this young fella came up. Uh, walked right up on the bridge, didn't, didn't look at me, didn't say one thing, kept right on walking, walked right across and got into the port side wing to look out. And then he came back inside and he says, uh, and who are you? I said, well, I'm your pilot. He says, well, I'm the captain. And he was dressed in a black leather jacket, black leather pants. So I stuck my hand out and I said, well, good evening, sir. My name's George Watkins, I'm your pilot. He says, you know, I don't believe I've ever seen you before. And I said, well, that's perfectly understandable, sir. I said, because this being a really small ship is always handled by our apprentices. And tonight, all the apprentices were busy. And when it came to be filled, my order was filled. I was at the top of the list, so that's why I'm here. And he said, well, you know, by Jove, I'm glad you explained that to me. With all that gray hair, I thought you were a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Thank you very much. Okay, Miss Sue. You better show up here. programs so you know what else is going to be in this season. Again, I appreciate you all coming. This is a wonderful crowd. Please tell your friends because we have found that more people come because of word of mouth than anything we ever put in the paper or advertise anywhere. We also passed out some evaluation forms. Uh, we're as interested in um, 
what you thought about the program as you giving us ideas for future programs. So if there's something else that you think that we ought to present, we will start working on the 2018-19 season if uh, we can keep up this kind of attendance. So please let us know. And thank you again for coming. If you need a pen, we have some over on the, uh, the other table over there. We can pass them out, but uh, please leave them on your chairs and we'll pick them up or pass them to somebody on your way out. Thank you again for coming.